Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mind Pump. In the first half of the show today, we talk about how cutting the weight that you lift in half can actually improve your results. Later, we talk about our favorite music to listen to when lifting, as well as the benefits of cold therapy and other topics. In the second half of the show, the guys coach four live callers on questions such as the job I'm training for has me doing a lot of cardio, so I'm having a hard time packing on muscle and gaining weight. What should I do? Do you build muscle faster on a dirty bulk or a clean bulk? Should I eat before or after my morning workout? And how can I train for bodybuilding and powerlifting at the same time so I not only look great, but I'm strong as well. Finally, if your favorite part of this show is the Q&A portion where we take questions from our Instagram or have live callers, you can find all of those clips over at our other channel, Mind Pump Clips, right here on YouTube. All right, enjoy the show. Check this out. This is a great workout for gains, especially if it's different from what you're doing now. So check this out. Use half the weight you normally use, Use half the intensity you normally use, but double the volume of your workout. In other words, if you do three sets for a body part, do six sets. If it's 10 sets, do 20 sets. But with half weight, half intensity, focus on the volume, the pump, the technique, and the form. It's very different and uh, always produces great results when it's novel. GVT. Ooh, they're higher intensity. Mm -hmm. Oh, I yeah. so... I, I think that's the mistake that you make when you do when you do. Well, I guess you, I guess you're right. Towards the end, it gets high. Yeah, yeah, I mean yeah. that. So uh, every time I so I do it similar, right? So and uh, I'll interrupt my training, and I'm like, you know what? When's the last time I just did you know ten sets of bench, or yeah. you know, like I'll and I'll do that. And every time I do that, I base the weight off of like my standard you know sets of four or five my strength and think well if I take about twenty five or thirty percent off of that I should be good. Nope. And and you know the first three sets is yeah. easy breezy, but by sets four five six like I'm cutting I away. Cut, oh, that. I oh I'm always off. I remember the last time I did that for bench I had thirty fives on by the end of the. Wow. Yeah, I was so depressed. That's embarrassing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. And you but, feel all sore as hell. But, you know, know I, so I like that you're presenting it this way for the audience because you, th that's a better approach. It, like you just, okay, I bench 225 when I work out, let's say, in my 5x5 five five type routine. Okay, I'm going to go in there and put, you know, 135 yep. or less. Yeah, so I call this the half, the, the half, half double uh, <clears throat> routine, right? And so I did it today, right? I went to the gym. I had a good amount of time. I was able to get up early. Everything was fine this morning. Baby stayed in bed, whatever. So I went to the gym and I, I cut all the weight in half. I cut my intensity way down. So the focus is just on the muscle and the movement. And then I doubled the volume. I did twice as much volume as I normally do. And it, it's, it was different because that's not how I've been training. So I got a crazy pump. Yeah. I felt really good. It's, it's a lot of fun to change it up. Swell up like a balloon. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And you do this uh, occasionally. Um, by the way, you could go in the opposite, right? You could take your workout double the, you know, the, or go heavy, double the intensity and cut the volume in half. Uh, yeah. this, this formula works in the opposite uh, direction as well. And when it's novel, that's the important thing here, by the way, when it's something that you're not currently doing, this is when you really start to reap the benefits. And lately I've been training with low volume, heavy weight, you know, longer rest periods type of deal. So I went in today, did this totally different and I could feel it. And you know, I've been working out long enough to know that I could feel that this was uh this was going to, you know, cause some changes, some positive changes. Oh, it feels yeah. good. That one's for me is it, it's like the the ultimate kind of uh, 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 what do you call it? Where it just like shakes everything up. And oh, just yeah. Like destroys you. Like yeah, it, plateau be, buster. Yeah. Because it's for me, it's like such a, uh, you know, dynamic shift from what I always tend to do, which is just, you know, one to five rep range and like focus on heavy, heavy lifting. And to get that kind of like rep count up and then the weight drop and all that, dude. dude whew, when's the last time you did? Brutal. When's the last time you did like a bodybuilding workout, like full bodybuilding? Not like oh, I did one, you know, set of curls. Like he that. does it more. It's <laughs> probably like the last challenge like we had, you know, really the four of us. See, he I never feel, does. I don't do it, dude. Like I, I mean, unless it's just that I I, I, I want to get. I catch you doing some stuff in there. You yeah, know? but those are like trigger sessions. It's, uh, it's not like okay, uh, you, you full on. Okay. I can't. Goes, I can't claim it, I've been doing. It like goes hypergamy. against his like core, bro. To like <laughs> to train for aesthetics. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's like, oh, he hates himself after. Because then I start looking at the mirror, and I'm like, who am I? You know. 
know. Like, <laughs> it gets away from me real quick. <laughs> it gets away from you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just yeah. like, God damn. He's like, look, damn, kid. I'm, ah, stop it. I'm so hot. Oh, yeah. it happened again. Exactly. Uh, but really, it's been it's been that long, huh? It has. Yeah, I know. I, I'm due for it. So this this is something that's been on my mind. Uh, you bringing that up, it's funny because like I'm I've been like teasing with the idea of like going more hypertrophy for a while and doing a phase at least for a couple months or so. Yeah. Do you have to change the music if you do something like that? Yeah. Yo, yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, if I go like my normal metal and heavy and yeah, I, I will just get too aggressive. And again, I'll miscalculate the hell out of the weight load yeah. and then destroy what's myself. Your, so I have your, to calm down. What's your bodybuilding playlist <laughs> sound like? Let's we know see. what Sal's is. Yeah. Because you know? I know you lean a little more to like hip hop or something, right? Yeah. If, yeah I'm helps, if I'm not, if I'm not trying to, if I, I had to scale intensity back, it's hip hop. Because mm-hmm. rock, rock is, I'm like, we're all the same when it comes to like, this is where I like heavy metal. Like if I'm going after it, it's yeah. heavy deadlifting or I'm, I'm pushing limits for sure. Heavy metal rock. And I would say. Yeah, but the heaviest you go with, uh, not weight, but with the music. Rage, like, tool. Yeah. That's, that's about as deep as you go. Yeah. Uh, maybe a little bit of Pantera every once in a while. Um, maybe some. Dude, what touring a, with Metallica. Uh, Deftones. Yes. I'll go Deftones. Um. But I, you guys, you guys Chevelle. like Chevelle. I love. Yeah. yeah, those are all those are all on my playlist, yeah. right? But uh, yeah, I don't go too crap. But I, I even listen to that too. Like, like so, like Tool for me is a nice mm. kind of cruise, train hard. Yeah. But I don't like. I'm not ang- like Rage is like angry. I got. I want to get after Pantera's yeah. angry. I want to get after it. Hip hop is like. I don't. I'm trying to avoid any level of intensity. <laughs> it's yeah. like I'm just kind of going through just the cruising, movements. I'm pumping. Grooving. Yeah, I'm pumping. I'm doing mobility. Like, yeah, I'm I, not a big hip hop guy. During- I listen to hip hop mainly for uh, if we're presenting or we're doing anything that like yeah. I'm in front of people because yeah. I don't know. It's like this ego pump. It you makes know? you feel cool. Yeah, you're just like, yeah, dude. I'm, no, it does. I, I mean, that's why I played ass. it in here the other day when we had the live I, event. Yeah. That puts me in the mood like that too. Yeah. I like yeah. that. If I go, if I'm going heavy-ish, then it's uh, what you, it's your playlist. Same thing. Rage Against the Machine, Tool, Chevelle, um, See, that's Rob like Zombie. Light for me. Yeah, Rob that's Zombie. That's real light for you. It, 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 well, when I'm going, when I, now when I go and I want to go as heavy as I can and mm-hmm. I want to try and hit PRs and go nuts and throw caution to the wind, then it's fast, it's evil, it's crazy <laughs> shit. It's Sepultura yeah. and the like. That's it's, a good one. Yeah, it's stuff like that where you almost can't make out what's going on in the song. You just hear yelling <laughs> and shit and it just makes me angry. I love it though. But when I'm doing like bodybuilding workout, uh-huh. it's uh, EDM. Oh, EDM is yeah, your dude. Move. It's, okay. it's like It's like rave music. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm still a little bit more in the rock genre. Like I'll go more like Royal Blood or, or uh, um, uh, you know, I guess I'm trying to think of the other name of some of these like kind of newer bands, but like like Led Zeppelin and uh, like I'll do some classic rock, I guess, like in that vein. But dude, like, dude, yeah, I'd, yeah, I can't go like too soft. I had to work out to like top forty the other day because I had my headphones and I you know put them on and then it makes that sound. Doo, 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 doo. I'm like, oh, it's gonna die. Uh-oh. My headphones are gonna die. Top forty? What's that? What do you That's mean? what the gym plays. Oh, because you were in the gym. Yeah, it was in the gym, uh, dude. Uh, so I was like, oh, it was a long time since I'd worked on out. there? Like Lil Nas and it's just uh, trash. W- whatever yeah. top 40, you know, trash. shit is. Like to Taylor Swift. The gym, and- like a commercial gym's trash. The only way you get good music in a, in a is a dungeon type gym. You might get oh, some. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you might get some good, yeah. good See, music. See, when I used to, so, when I, so back in the Which day. Which is understandable, right? You're in a commercial gym. You have to appeal to like the general audience. Like you're, you don't want like, you know, the 60-year-old grandma walks in and it's like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, come on over here. Let's check out this elliptical. <laughs> oh, did I ever tell you guys? Did I ever tell you guys one time, dude? This is great for your knees. You just reminded me of a hilarious Black memory. Black murder. I not when, like for everybody. When yeah. I had my wellness studio, I used to work out in the middle of the day sometimes, and it would be no one else in there. It'd be just me, sometimes yeah. a trainer, but no yeah. clients. Mm-hmm. And I would kind of turn the lights down because I liked it kind of dark. And I and if I was going to go heavy, I would do crazy metal or whatever. And I I remember this was towards the end of my workout, and I I was at this point I was trying to build my neck up. I was trying to, I was like, for fun. I was like, let's see if I get my neck strong. So I had this neck, <laughs> I had this neck harness on with chains coming out down the sides. Yeah, we're so similar yet so different in so many ways. I know. Totally different. <laughs> so you had one of those head chain yeah. You know you would do that. I've done neck training for yeah, sure, but it yeah. wasn't like a goal. No, it wasn't. He's all just built it on accident because I've <laughs> no. a beast. Well, he has a little more application when he's playing yeah, football and stuff. Yeah, when I was playing stuff. football, yeah, 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 he better. Yeah. Actually, wearing a helmet will build the shit yeah. out of your neck. Yeah. You put on a football helmet for for you know an hour yeah. i mean it'll mess yeah. you up anyway yeah. so 
I had the head head harness on. So remember, it's like leather straps, right? When are you wearing a helmet for an hour, by the way? Huh? When would you be wearing I played football for us, just like you. I I tried it out. Oh, I didn't know that. And I fucking hated it. Yeah. I don't think you've ever- Why have you never told me that? I did tell you guys. No, No. you haven't. Bro, I signed up because I- I, I I did not know this. I swear. I thought- He's never said this. Has he said this? What? No. News to me. I did. He remembers. Did you know? He's got the thumbs yeah, up. Yeah, he's definitely brought it up. You so, knew? Really? Yeah, I think Dude. if I remember. I did. Really? I'll uh-huh. let you tell the story. Mm. I yeah. did. So I tried out. Okay. Or not tried out. I, I, I mean, this was Pop Warner, right? So I signed up. I was probably 13, 13. maybe. Maybe 12, 13. And uh, I'm like, oh, this is going to be awesome. And they beat the shit out of us so bad. And the coaches were yelling. And I was like, <laughs> ready to throw up. Yep. And I remember being like, ah. I don't, I don't know if know. I'm wow, you had the same experience as I, so I did. Wild. We've had a lot of real similar things like that. Very similar. Yeah, but anyway, so this I, did not know that. I had the head harness on, leather straps, chains coming down. I had like three 25 pound plates on, just hanging in between my legs. <laughs> okay. Crazy ass heavy metal music. And I'm, uh, and then I kind of pulled my neck. So I stand up and I had this metal hook looking thing with the ball at the end that yeah. I would use to press on my traps. Oh, okay. So now I'm we're... holding this metal hook with the ball at the end with the chains off my head also and this old lady walks in <laughs> she opens the door and the nice metal evil evil and it's like raw, 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 and I got chains and I got this metal hook and I'm looking at her <laughs> she, hey this is what she did she went like this she went ooh and she oh, like, ooh, it's not for me that was it I was like no no I love training old never people came, yeah, never came back to this never <laughs> lost the client like that it was uh, fucked up no yeah. All right, today's program giveaway is MAPS Split. This is a pure bodybuilding workout program designed by us. Here's how you can win the program. Uh, Here's how you enter, okay? Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode, and then subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications, do all those things. If we declare you the winner, we'll let you know in the comment section that you won, and then you got free access to MAPS Split. Also, got a sale going on right now. Uh, Check this out. We put together an at-home workout holiday bundle. Uh, So MAPS Anywhere, MAPS Suspension, MAPS Prime, and the No BS six-pack formula all require little to no equipment. So they're great for at-home workouts. We put them all together. The retail price is $338, but right now we made them $99.99. So $99.99 and $0.99. You get all those programs at the at-home holiday bundle. So if you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below to get signed up. All right, here comes the show. No, I was gonna. I was gonna bring up. Uh, I see the cold plunge is starting to get used now. Bro. Nobody was using that, That's and now, gnarly. huh? That's so gnarly. You, you went in. You, you dipped. Huh? I did it. I did a minute. That was it. Uh, I know you did two minutes. I don't know what's wrong with no, you. No, I did five. I did five yesterday. Five minutes. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm up to over over four. Actually, I don't think when it's, you first started, what'd you start with? Two. Wow, you went two right out. Yeah, the you case. need to you need to go two. Like I don't one, like you're, cold. Not, you're not getting shit at one, bro. Really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not getting any benefits. I mean, maybe it, it, itsy bitsy. You know, yeah. you got you need a little more than that. I think. Okay, so it's like a uh, splash. I had I heard I, got, I, got I heard to, Andrew. I got to start little by little. You know? I heard Andrew Huberman talk about what the what the studies show yeah. as far as getting uh, reaping. Uh, the the most benefits for the least amount of time in there. It's twice it, a week, right? It's 15 minutes total in the. Uh, oh. No, excuse me, 12 minutes total for the week. 12 oh, to 15. So I didn't do shit. Yeah. So, so this, so my, my thought is I get at least three sessions in of four minutes is, is my, is my minimum goal. I try and do every day. Um, but it, I know I want to get in there at least three. So times. here's, what's weird. I, I've noticed this about people is that you either tolerate hot very well, or you tolerate cold very well. I'm, I'm okay. You and I are like each other here. I'm more the steam sauna guy. Yeah. I, the cold thing is fucking miserable, yeah. man. No, it's been a, it's because I can do hot forever. I can sit in a steam room or a sauna, no, I, and I could just. And I tell you, no uh, I'm, I'm, I've been consistently doing this now, and it's still a motherfucker. It uh, every time I get in it, it's like, oh, oh, it's not. It, it doesn't get. I mean, what gets easier? Oh, it gets easier. What gets easier is. I have the ability to calm myself down really quick now, and I know what I need to do yeah. to get in that space. And so that 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 part gets easier, but the feeling it gives me is just as you know gnarly what? every time. Well, so when I did it, I only did it for a minute, but you get a very distinct dopamine oh, yeah. boost afterwards. And now the problem is <laughs> to get the dopamine, you got to go through the shit, but that's also a feature. So they they show that when you have to do hard work to get dopamine, you don't get the negative uh, like feedback loop that you might get with like drugs and shit like that. So if your dopamine comes from something that was hard, it's a good thing. If your dopamine comes from something that's easy, like taking a pill, then it can become a problem. 
Oh, is that true? That is true. 100%. That's interesting. So it's like it's like uh, you know, like you climbed a mountain or you did this crazy ass hike and you're super exhilarated, right? Very different than getting exhilarated from taking a pill, like an opiate. Or, correct. Interesting. Correct. So it's the hard before the reward that makes it different. What is it that? What is it? Is it like there? Is there a mechanism that's different? I'm when sure. You, I'm huh. sure there is. But I, yeah, this is. Uh, huh. Yeah, I got to read a little bit more about it. But so cold dipping. By the way, do you know the cold dips? Um, uh, some people get addicted to them. Do you guys know that? Yeah. So well, I mean, of course, it's another you getting this huge yeah. dopamine rush. I yeah. guess. I mean, there's it's a the the part that I really enjoy is the after effect. I yeah. mean, it to me, it 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 shits on any pre workout caffeine drink I could ever take. Oh, you're energized for like five hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. a. And you know what I noticed yesterday? Because yesterday was the long, five minutes is the longest I, I've stayed in there now. <laughs> It took me like uh, hours later to warm up, so mm -hmm. I I can I can imagine right the, the bone huh? the calorie burn uh, benefits that my body probably get of trying to reacclimate my body. It to converts white fat to brown fat, dude. Mm -hmm. I I was you know drive that? I was mm -hmm. driving home yesterday. It was a, it was a moderately warm day yesterday, and I and I had a flannel on and stuff like that. And normally by the time we get this fucking sauna out of here, sorry, Doug, I've been swearing a lot today. I just caught that. Um, I, I feel my, I'm like ready to get down to a t-shirt, but after doing that, yeah. I was cold all the way home yeah. Katrina had the fire. I was standing for the fire. I was like, Oh wow. That actually took a while yeah. to heat my temperature back up. And you can only imagine when you're running that cold, the, the body working to get its temperature back up. I'm sure. No, I, no that's, that's yeah. what, that's so 100%. you didn't go sauna after that and no, like try and warm yourself back up. I like up. sauna first. <laughs> so that's I haven't I been do. doing, um, so I was on before we had the cold plunge. I was pretty consistent with the sauna. So I've been, I've trained hot for quite some time now. I'm not consistent with the cold plunge, so that's more of a priority for me. And I've been doing and that what I like about the cold plunge is it's a it's a quick in and out. The sauna our sauna takes freaking yeah, 30, takes 30 40 minutes to warm up, to warm up and yeah. then it, you know and then you got to sit and then in you're there sitting for, there for twenty minutes. Yeah. So the cold plunge is like yeah. I just got to make Race that commitment go. real quick. So like I'm so do it. brown fat is thermogenic body fat. So this is body fat on your body that burns calories and it, it's it warms you up. And when you do cold therapy. Your the white fat. By the way, white fat's harder to burn. It's not thermogenic. It sticks to your body more. In other words, if you have body fat, you want it to be the brown fat. That's the kind that's thermogenically active. Doing the cold dips converts the white fat to brown fat. So actually, because your body's adapting to be able to warm up better, so you're actually making your body. That's that's your speculation. You're actually teaching your body to burn more calories on its own. Yeah. In yeah. essence, speeding up your metabolism through converting fat. Yeah. Yeah. Which is pretty wild. Yeah. No. It's it's I'm. Yeah, so many know. crazy like, health benefits to it. I'm 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 super. Did you guys? Do you guys super know about it now? Like so, it's it's I've noticed. I mean, the fact that I that I've made it this far into winter with the, the amount of people we've had around us sick, and even like another thing, I always get sick traveling. Like to mm -hmm. like we've been doing flights to Utah and stuff like that, and being in the airplane yeah. airport, like touching stuff. Like I almost always get sick. I've been good. Did I? So um so you guys know Jessica? She learned Russian, and then her when it, she, she speaks was, Russian. You did. Come yeah, on. I remember you saying that. Yeah, I do remember that one, but not the when football. When do you tell these stories? On the podcast. Is he telling the podcast? <laughs> Where are you telling Did you these? know that too? You yeah. didn't know that, Yeah, she's you? learned a couple languages, yeah, right? You've been forgetting a lot lately, Adam. Is it, is, I'm forgetting a lot? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think I just, I think I've just learned it. Products I think I just learned it. We better hurry up. Really. Yeah. We better hurry up and retire before Adam's brain goes completely. <laughs> Don't smoke weed, kids. No, no, yeah. no, no. So she, uh, yeah, she's a, uh, I mean, she's a very intelligent person. At one point, so her ex-husband was Ukrainian. And she traveled with Cirque du Soleil, a lot of Russian acrobats. Her ex-husband's family spoke Russian. So she decided, I'm going to learn Russian. So she speaks it fluently. She's been to Russia. She's been to Ukraine. <coughs> she said that it is a common practice in some of those places where when they bathe a child, that at the very end, they do a cold, mm -hmm. they do like a cold rinse, freezing cold rinse. Well, you guys remember yeah. Kingsbury, right? Yeah. Kyle's kids never had warm water. Yeah, yeah. it's always cold. Yeah, they, they from out the gates. I they, remember him saying that. Yeah. So I started doing this with Aurelius. So he'll take a shower with me sometimes, and then I make it a game afterwards. I make it cold, and I go, all right, you ready? And then we go in there, and, I, and I'm going to start doing this a little bit more regularly. But there's videos. You can watch videos of Russian school children where it's snowing outside and they'll take like a 15 minute recess break and they go out in their bathing suit and play in the snow. Okay, so this yep. is going to be interesting how how this w plays out for you because so I tried to introduce Max to cold water um early on like this and I did it through the swimming pool and it like totally turned him off 
to getting in the pool for like a year because of that. You and I, hard, I could only, fast? I guess I could only get him into like a heated pool or jacuzzi <laughs> after that. Like I could not get, if it was even just like Your slightly bougie like you, dude, he was, it was, and I, I blame myself that I, you know, I try to get him to acclimate yeah. to really cold pool water and he was just not so having So I figured it. that too. I thought, okay, well, he's with Aurelius. I'm like, if I make him hate this, he'll never want to do it again. Yeah. yeah. So I made it a game. So I said, oh, I'm going to make it cold. You And I made it cold. And I'm like, oh my God, it's so cold. And I'll like, pretend to go in. And then I'll, I give him a little cup that he he splashes water on me. Yeah. So I was like, oh my God, don't get me wet. And then of course he splashes me. Then I splash him. And then I go, you ready? And then I go in and we stay in there for like, just like 15 seconds, and then he laughs, and then we're done. You know what happened yesterday? My uh, Our teachers, Max's teachers, uh, suggested to Katrina or implied that, you know, to consider putting him in a speech therapy again. Mm. Uh, and I thought that was interesting because um, she was saying that, you know, right now they have issues sometimes where the kids are playing, and, like, he's moved to the ne next level up of age. So mm -hmm. he's with uh, – his kids are all his age and older. He was – his speech was a little delayed as far as his ability to communicate – and I was actually telling Katrina, I'm the one who's like more paranoid with that. I'm the one that kind of pushed the the speech therapist early. And I was like, you know, he's he should be starting to to say more things. And and then of course I told you guys we went through it and they were like, oh, he's totally understands, it'll come, yeah. like and it happened. So she's like, the kids will get into it or something, and then the other kids can articulate what what happened, and he get you can tell he gets frustrated when he gets lost for words. Um, but I told her, I was like, you know, I said, I'm, I'm never opposed to having a professional, uh, you know, see him and then give mm -hmm. their advice. I said, but I'm, I'm less worried this time. And she's like, really? And she's like, you're the one that was so, you know, pushing that. I said, well, he's progressing. I see it every, I see it every month right now. If he was stagnant, I would be concerned. That's a very good point. Really. I was like, yeah, I would be more concerned. I said, what you're, what the teacher's experiencing is that they're all those kids have are were are ahead of him. He's just he's playing. Yeah. He's catching up. Yeah, I yeah. said they went through that too. It was just a year ago for them. Yeah. You know, they went through the like where they can kind of communicate, and so he's he's behind on that. And so then I said the teacher is just saying that to you because it's hard for her. It's hard for her because he's the only one of those kids in that group that can like articulate mm -hmm. his or his point right. And so. I'm like, I, I mean, do it. I said, have the speech therapist talk to him. I said, I'm totally open to hearing their opinion. But mm. I mean, the kid is like every week says a new sentence of something that mm. he couldn't say before. Being but being around those other kids is really going to help, you know, elevate. Oh, that yeah. Sure. I mean, I see I told you guys just the other day, like how how cute it is. We we put him on the, the FaceTime with oh, yeah, his with friend his who's four who could like totally talk yeah. like and. And you hear them, they're they're communicating back and forth. And so I see him progressing like every week. So I'm like, eh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, if he, if he, because with that kind of stuff, if he enjoys it, it doesn't hurt, right? So you that's know. what I said. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't care. Because if, if you've ever watched them work with kids, the good ones, they make it fun. The kid enjoys it. So it's mm. like, okay, well, you know, it won't hurt or whatever. But he understands everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. You talk to him. Yeah. Like he just, you just see he's, he gets like, sometimes he's lost for the word. Yeah. And you could see him searching and then he gets a little frustrated like yeah. that when he's with kids that are the, and they're moving fast and doing something. I'm like, yeah, but every kid goes through that. He just he's going through it later because he was delayed, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So, I mean, as long as I see progression mm -hmm. and that what I didn't see a year and a half ago, that mm -hmm. was what's kind of making me worry. Where mm -hmm. now I'm like, nah, he's he's picking up. Dude, shoes. I was uh, I was uh, uh, holding my my infant daughter right, Dahlia. So now she's like, what, two and a half, two and a half weeks. And uh, I was changing her diaper and I'm looking at her little little legs. I love baby legs. So I was, I was like squeezing them and whatever. Oh, chunky. I just love them. But you know, she's not chunky yet. She's only two and a half weeks old. But I look at her legs and I'm like, hell yeah, dude. She inherited Jessica's muscle bellies. That's two for two now. <laughs> like, yes. I got two kids, you know, because Jessica's sure. got these really long muscle bellies, long calves and quads and hams and all this. Other. So I'm looking at her. I'm like, babe, look at her calves. She's going to have nice calves. I'm like, hell yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, awesome. you were going to say something. That. What were you going to say? Yeah, no, I had a funny story actually with uh, Everett and and Ethan too. Like they're they're both kind of in this phase right now where they're trying to get attention from the other se opposite sex and oh. trying to figure all this stuff. They out. both are. Even they both Everett. are. Yeah, oh, I think I think too the older brother kind of Influences. like having a bit of a girlfriend now, uh, quote unquote, has. Uh, kind of spawn his interest a little bit more uh, to to see what he can do. But anyways, it's just like it's so insanely typical, like of like the the pulling hair, the lighting on fire, the, the throwing stuff at girl to get attention stuff. But like, so his this is what happened with him, and he was telling me about this. So I was dying <laughs> laughing because um, this girl that he kind of likes, like, so she she grabbed his friend's hat, 
and goes and puts it on and is like, you know, trying to be like, um, uh, <coughs> flirty, I guess some, some yeah. bit with them. Right. Yeah. Like, and just have fun with them. And so he's like, he's like, Oh, Oh no, you put the hat on. He's like, Jameson has lice. Oh, <laughs> she's like, she's like, ah, oh, like takes it off. And he's like, did he really have lice? Or is he no, no, like, he's no, just, he's just not. messing he's with her, you know. Oh, and like, I'm like, dude, you gotta like say, I'm just kidding, you know. Like, <laughs> let her just keep thinking. Like, now she's got lice. She's gonna oh go home God, and cry. He's your, he's your son, you know. Sure. It, oh, I was dying, dude. And uh, uh, yeah, there's there's a bunch of other like funny things like he was telling me about. Um, one of them was uh, uh, was a dweeb. So he has. He has this um, kind of term that he just came up with for like kids that are like really into anime because he just doesn't get it. Yeah. And it was funny. It was the first time I heard him swear to me. Like he doesn't do it or anything, but he's just like, he's like, uh, there's this one name for, um, I'm trying to look at like the name. Oh, of Naruto. It. Naruto. Yeah, I he's like, that. who the hell is Naruto? You know who that is? Of course I do. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm You're, like, I don't a, know who the hell Naruto dude. is. Like where they come up with these names, yeah. you know? And he's like going off about like, I don't, I don't understand it. And he like calls them dweebs. Or, or, or uh, uh, weebs, weebs. I remember you saying this Weak, yesterday. Weak, Weak dweebs. dweebs. You're not even a, a you're not even a normal dweeb. Weebs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I'm gonna use that. Oh yeah. Way to go, Justin. You're building yourself a little bully, just yeah. like you said. I mean, the apple. The apple doesn't fall you that know, far. It's it's just jokes, dude. Yeah, like, no, he's got a great sense of humor. He he does. Does. Yeah, he, 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 he delivers it like, all cheeky, so it's not like it's, it is true. Boys are well, God, we're kind of doofuses for a long time with flirting with girls, aren't we? Like, there's because my my daughter has there's this boys in her class that mess with her all the time, and uh, I know it's because they're trying to flirt with her. Yeah, but, yeah. but they're just. They're, you know, how boys are. It's a transition. You, you, it takes a while to really figure that out. Like how to like, uh, it was be a couple funny, but like not hurt feelings and, and, um, you know, be able to get attention, yeah. but like the right attention. Yeah. yeah no, so, totally. So I'll do, uh, do one of the commercials right now. Cause then I want to transition us into a conversation. I, I want to ask you guys about that. I heard. Those. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're supposed to talk about, uh, Organifi and Felix Gray. I actually have a study on Felix Gray. We'll get to that later, which is kind of cool, but Organifi, we're still getting, great feedback on uh, peak power. So a lot of people are saying that uh, they like it more than their pre-workout because they need, they need less caffeine with it. That's what they're saying. Have you Didn't heard what the, the average scoop is? Cause I know you made it to where it's designed to where you can kind of one oh, scoop one is hundred milligrams of caffeine. Oh, it's, it's oh, 150 for some reason. No, hundred. Oh. So two is 200 yeah. and three, obviously 300. Yeah. I'm doing <laughs> Good math, math there. Yeah, there you go. So you want to guess what four is? Anybody have a guess? So, uh, I think I can handle that. So, I do 300 milligrams of caffeine normally before a workout, but with peak power, 200 is where I go. And yeah. I feel just as good, actually better, because I don't get the, you know, the, the jitters. What, no, that's the that. feedback I'm, I'm hearing the most from it is yep. the people love that was 100% the, the, the smooth, my goal. The smooth caffeine high that you get from yep. it without the, the jitters and the tingles that you get with a lot of pre workouts yep. and stuff, which I'm, I'm glad you didn't do that because that's my least favorite part. It is. It makes my face itch and yeah. I don't like a lot no, of didn't you have somebody like email you that they PR. Uh, using it, I did. I did. Somebody We're using that it. for a commercial later. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Okay, my bad. I don't want to expose. <laughs> yeah, oh, like I pr too. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Oh, so right, okay. So listen. So yesterday I was. So we have. Um, Chris Williamson, um, who does mo he's got the Modern Wisdom podcast. Really like this guy. Um, I've I've watched quite a bit of his uh, his interviews. He's a great interviewer. Had some, he's had huge names on there. He's had Jocko, Jordan Peterson. I mean, you name it. He's had our friends, Max Lugavere and stuff. Just Max had great things to say about him. So we have him coming in studio, I think, uh, next month. If that, you know, Doug, I think it's next month. I don't know. It's day. okay. You know, the, I, mean, I think it's next month. We have him coming in. And then right after that, we were going out to AZ and we'll see Alex Hormozzi. And so there's actually uh, an interview a few months ago that Chris did of Alex and I was listening to it was a great conver really good conversation so check it out uh, if you like either one of those guys but Chris brought something up that I've never heard someone say before and I thought it was a really uh, interesting um point I guess uh, it, he says that um he's been kind of toying around with this idea that we all have a different materialism set point and I thought, oh, that's a really interesting, like what we like, like how much like material yeah. stuff we want, what we feel comfortable with. Right, right. Before like we start downgrading. <clears throat> well, before, uh, before the, like, it's like we've talked and we know this, like there are studies yeah. to support that, you know, if you're, you're poor and you have no money, like. You, 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 getting, you get happier. Yeah, you get happier, right? right? So a material set point is at one point, everybody has a point 
where they More reach make they reach yeah. peak happiness and then it's either plateaus uh, or actually dips down afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. So he's like, you know, I, I think that there's this there's this and I think that it's unique to the individual. I mean, we've everyone's met that friend who's like, I you know li could live in a trailer and as long as they have their basic needs met, yeah. they're as happy as they can get and they have no desire for things. Think of other people that feel like they yeah. need this you know ten thousand square foot house to feel like they they're they're comfortable or whatever. So um, I thought that was a really interesting mm. conversation. And do you guys think that you have figured out what your ma materialism set point is in your life? And have you noticed that because everyone's at a place, I think, financially where they've probably reached that or maybe maybe beyond uh, that you don't get any happier. And do you remember how you came about figuring that out? Like, oh, like he like Hermosi talked about how they they ended up buying like this massive house at one point and then realized like. You know, it was so big that they they needed someone to take care of the the cleaning, and they needed someone yeah. to take to uh, take care of the upkeep of the pool. And he's like, you know, landscaper. And he's like, before you know it, it was like we had another business mm -hmm. that we had to manage. And they, they realized, like, man, it. I don't feel any happier having all this extra space. I would rather get rid of all these people we have to manage now and mm -hmm. live in something more modest. And then if we need big stuff, we'll travel to it for vacations or things like that. And I thought that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. And so. Have, do you feel like you guys are still figuring that out for yourself or do you feel like you've already kind of figured that out? And then if you have already figured that out, what were, were those those key signs or indicators that that made you feel that way? That's a good question. Uh, and you know, what's interesting, too, about that is if you have any insecurities around feeling secure, <laughs> I guess, then that's probably going to skew what's going to make you feel comfortable, you know? Um, so I could see that as well. What do you mean by that? Like, well, if you grew up and money was uh, an issue or a challenge or you, you you know what it's like to not be able to pay bills, stuff like that, or when you were a kid, it was unstable, you may feel more comfortable, you know, because with more and more because it's, you, you, because it's an insecurity, right? So I could see how that can uh, make an impact or maybe even the reverse. You I would think actually, it'd be the reverse. I would think you think you need, like, that was my experience, right? My experience was, I, that's how I grew up. I assumed that I needed so much more in order to feel yeah. good. And I, once you reach that, surpass that, surpass that, it, it, yeah. it kind of clicks. You go, oh, shit. No, I don't. Like, that that's my own insecurity that's telling me yeah. that I think I need all this. And so, yeah, I mean, you're I- You're such a self-aware person. You're not the typical person. You know what I mean? <clears throat> like the typical person is not nearly as self-aware as you. And so, I, I, but anyway, my point is, boy, so many things play a role in that. I, I mean, for me- I don't need much at all. And I, I identified this for me a long time ago. I like to have, I want to have enough space to where, you know, my kids have a bedroom. I, uh, that's it. I like to not have to worry about money. So as far, now, what does that mean for me? I like to eat out here and there. I like to go on vacations a couple times a year. I don't need a whole lot. I know mm -hmm. that about myself. So if I were to spend more money, it would be on experiences. Now, did you uh, did you find yourself over time coming to that conclusion, or have you felt like you've always been aware that even when you were young and uh, super young and ambitious, you were like, "Yeah, I, I only need to get to about this point." My ambition good. was never um, was wasn't really ever <laughs> motivated by the money. It was more motivated by the success and accolades, and mm -hmm. then what I could accomplish. But the money and the money was like a, a nice side effect of it. So I was never like. Uh, oh, I want to hit this dollar amount and hit that dollar amount. It was more like um, I want to be able to be the top person in this category, or I want to be able to build my business to this. Um, so that's kind of what always you like wanna... winning more than you actually yeah. like money. Yeah. Now, now I've never been in a position where money was super challenging for me, so I don't know what that would look like. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe once, one time I was, there was a, there was one period where where I had to live paycheck to paycheck for, but it wasn't very long. It was like a few months. But I just don't need much. I don't need much to feel happy. I, I like to not worry about it. In other words, if something were to happen and I were to make no money, I like to have at least six months to a year's worth of savings uh, where I would be okay. That's kind of where, but I, it, but again, what does that mean for, for person to person? No. Okay. So it doesn't sound like you had like this epiphany or this time in your life no. where this really came, came full yeah. circle. Justin, did you have a time where you're like, yeah. you realize this? Um. Yeah. So for me, it was really the intensity of, of paycheck to paycheck and kind of digging myself out of a, a massive hole was when Courtney was pregnant with Ethan. Uh, and we were living with my in-laws for a bit. 
um, for a couple months. And I was like stacking as many chips as possible, working three jobs. And she was working on top of it till the very end uh, as a nurse and then um, trying to, to build up as much for um, maternity leave after that. And it was like, we were just on the pure hustle. I didn't, I didn't sleep much. Like I was just kind of in and out. I didn't even want to stay at my in-laws. And so it was like, it, to me, it's kind of a blur because it was just like, it, it was so much intensity around of like me getting out of that situation. Mm -hmm. And I, I was very thankful that they allowed me to do that to save around here in California uh, was huge. And, and then um, we finally were able to, kind of go and I considered about like renting and we were renting before but we really wanted to have that kind of security and uh stability so we were able to kind of put our money towards this real uh, uh sort of house that was like just modest and 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 had potential for me to be able to build and grow uh, the family with. And so that was like, okay, I got to now put all of my skills into this and then try to build a comfortable environment for, for my family in this situation. And so it was just, I think it was a lot of, um, just, uh, just running and, and not necessarily considering that it, things could get easier until I got to a point where, um, you know, the paychecks, we're, we're getting better and bigger and I was able to kind of keep her um, for, for Everett off longer, but then it set us back again uh, and we yeah. kind of like went all the way back because I did a full year of her off work and it was all um, dependent on whatever income I was bringing in. So uh, honestly, it wasn't until like our stuff really started to take off uh, here at Mind Pump uh, to where I felt like, oh, wow, like the intensity of... of of the basic necessities and, and being able to cover all this stuff was sort of lifted. And I'm like, wow, this is a totally different feeling for me. I, I always felt like I was like just this hamster on a wheel, uh, it, just trying to grind. Like the whole button for me was just grind. I'm going to work my way through whatever is presented to me. So uh, just having that kind of uh, lift and being able to now consider like, I don't have to, um, I don't have to like, <laughs> go through the, 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 the punishing kind of like, I have to do all these things and put it all on my shoulders anymore was uh, enormous. So I honestly, I don't, I feel like the size of my house now, the, the access for them to be able to walk to school, like just the, the, the overall flexibility of our business, what we're doing with growth in this business. Like I honestly, I'm already there. So I, I feel like yeah. I'm super content. What about you, Doug? <clears throat> yeah. So when I was younger, I thought, you know, I had these massive visions of great wealth, you know, big house, uh, all the amenities that go along with being very wealthy. And, uh, but the reality was that I struggled for a lot of years. You know, I had debt, I, I didn't make a lot of money. And, uh, so all, all during that time, I held this vision of, you know, making all this money, but now, that I don't have any debt and bills are paid. I have a lot more contentment in my life. So I hit a point where it's like, okay, I don't need to live in a massive place, even though I still have goals about say building a bigger house and things like that. I feel like, you know, anything extra uh, as far as that is concerned is not really going to add to the quality of my life a whole lot. Yeah. Uh, as Sal mentioned, I think experiences are really probably the thing that's going to add the most to the quality of your life. Uh, traveling for me is very important. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm not, I still have a lot of goals. Okay. Yeah. But I don't feel like those goals are going to change my life in a substantial way. Yeah. Yeah. And two, to add, like I'm in terms of being content, like I, I still look at anything now as a reflection of uh, like our own success and like where we're going. Like I, I'm very much attached to like the trophy just because of sports and everything else, like being able to elevate and, and achieve new things. And so I'm just, I'm driven by that still. Like that's the big driver for me is to like, where, where can I go that I've never been? I always want to go to the next level of where I've never been. Yeah. Yeah. I actually think that we're all really actually similar in this area. I think that our materialism set points are just a little bit different, but as far as our philosophy around what we're looking for, what we want, I think it's all, it's actually more, I think it's more similar than it's not. Yeah. It just, there's different stuff. Like, yeah. Like would you want to live in a 10,000 square foot 
no mansion no no no. i know that already i mean i'm in i'm in four thousand square feet for just katrina and i and that's, max I mean, that's it that's plenty it, oh yeah, yeah it's more than enough i mm-hmm. i mean even this this next move that we're doing we're gonna downgrade slightly in space not a lot but enough that i'm like there was a whole room that like never got used yeah. it's like yeah it's a little in a little wasteful like there, there's no need for i would that. rather have land than a big house you know what i'm saying like space where i could do things on there like i've always wanted to build a gym you know, and maybe build like a guest house, but I wouldn't necessarily want like a massive, you know why? Because then your kids, you don't even see your kids. They're in their room over here, over there. You got to text them on the phone to come, have them come downstairs. You know, it's just, yeah, no, there's definitely drawbacks to, you know, bigger and more. I mean, the, the, you get that much space and that it, to maintain it becomes like another job or more work. And it's like, Oh, that, you know, that's so there, I do think there's a, a happy medium there. I mean, I learned my lesson, uh, before actually mind pump, you know, so I, yeah, I, I kind of reached that that financial place that I was chasing when I when I got into cannabis. So this time around for me, when you know going through this whole process, I had such a better relationship with money and materialistic things and stuff yeah. like that. And I like nice stuff. There's no doubt. Like I don't I don't try and deny or, or or hide that. But my relationship with it is so different. I think I'm like I align a lot with Doug's kind of attitude and philosophy is I love nice things, but I don't I, I can also not, you know, it's it not make, you don't care. Yeah, yeah. I already recognize that more of those nice things aren't going to make me any happier as a person. And so but I like the option. I like the idea that, you know, if I want to do that or if I want that, I can, you know, and I, but I choose many times not to, I don't know how, I mean, I just did it uh, uh, two nights ago where I'll, you know, uh, I feel like I think I really want something. I'd shop it all in the shopping cart, you know, and it's, and it's not even crazy amount of money for me to, 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 to say yes and send it. And then I go, you know, yeah, but do, you need do it? I really need yeah. it? I've, you know, I've already yeah. got this, enough of those things like that tomorrow. If I still feel that passionate about it and you know, I didn't buy uh, you it. Know, you Arthur know, just, Brooks says that mm-hmm. the part of the, one of the keys to happiness is not, um, is not getting, it's not having more, it's wanting less. Mm. He mm. said for a lot of mm-hmm. people, for most people, that's the key. It's not, it's just wanting <clears throat> less. It's not getting more. And that makes to me, that makes a whole lot of sense. It's like, uh, there was, I can't, I, you know, there was this one article I read years ago. And then I remember I was talking to my dad about it because my dad grew up very differently than I did. He was very poor when he grew up. And I, I read this article and it said that there's a, the myth that it's more expensive today than it was 60 years ago. And they said, the reason why people think it's more expensive is we don't compare apples to apples. We have more bills for more stuff that we don't necessarily need. He goes, but if you lived the way someone did 60 years ago, Mm -hmm. where you don't have three cars in car payments, you don't have all these streaming services, you don't have- I I grew up, my first first computer that I had was when I was 20 something years old. I mean, now in our house, we've got- you know, four laptops, a computer. Yeah. We all have a computer and our phone. You know what I'm saying? Like that was a huge, that was a luxury to have something like that. Well, that's what that, this, this article said. Yeah. It said that. It literally said, actually, if you compare apples to apples, it's far less expensive today than it was back then. The difference is we've changed our our wants. We want more, more, more. We think we need more, more, more. When in reality, uh, and that's why, I mean, that's I, I would say that's one of the, one of the factors that's playing into the depression and anxiety. hundred percent. I think you brought it up mm-hmm. a long time ago. And I guess I had never really thought about that until you had brought it up on one show. This was a long time ago when you talked about somebody who would be considered in uh, poverty today. If you, the, if you just took what was in their, their place where they live and you compared it to somebody 150 years ago or whatever, like they would be wealthy Compared to that, when you look at, they would have, they probably have a, oh, a, a little TV, a po- a, some, they have a microwave, they have they have these things that would be like, and that's not, I'm saying 150, probably not even 150. No, years. you go, listen, a person today who's, uh, let's say lower middle class or, or even in poverty today has access to things that didn't exist a thousand years ago when, with, when Kings existed. So they have more than a King did a thousand years ago. Yeah. Right. So that's just it goes to show you the problem is the comparison. It's, the other guy has more than I do. And then it's the wants. I think I want that. That's what I need. That's what I need. And so that's never ending. And it results in just feeling like shit. I told Jessica this. I said, I would rather, I would prefer to, if I had a choice of retiring with a big old house, you know, mansion, whatever, or 
her and I live for six months in the year in a, like a townhouse in different parts of the country. One time in Hawaii, one time over here. But I'm like, I would be way, I would way enjoy that living in like an apartment or something for three to six months out of the year in other you know parts of the world versus having this massive. For me, I feel like that would be so much more fulfilling than have this huge like you know crazy house or whatever. Yeah, I like the I like us. I mean, obviously, I, I probably have uh, more space than than necessary out of everybody. My favorite part about that is that it it's it solved a lot of issues with in our relationship of I'm a bit of a neat freak. And if there's clutter that starts to clutter on the the counters and things like that, yeah. mm -hmm. that really so the fact that I have so much extra space, yeah. there's a place for me to do, you do on things top all of each other. Yeah, I gotta that, go that. I I <laughs> value do you purge I, annually. Do you like throw? I shit do. Away? I do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just did it. I just did it in my closet uh, the other day. Especially with us having an apparel business, we have so many. Dude, damn Jessica's shirts. brutal with that. Brutal. With p purging, she so, will throw shit. I am like, too, but Katrina, we never use it. Katrina's throw. hard. Katrina's yeah. really hard. To she holds on to her stuff. She holds on to Max's stuff, and I'm just like, hun, this is like you. You haven't wore it any. If my rule is this: if it's in my closet and I purge it annually, and I didn't wear it for the year, it's got to go. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Unless it has some sentimental value to it, like oh, this was my first jersey I ever bought. Sure. I mean, that's, that's different. different. Like that's something that I'll mm -hmm. probably save and then turn it into a fucking quilt. Did you I ever know, tell five you, years from did now? I ever tell you what my dad did because he he proved a point to my mom once. So obviously four kids and you know growing up probably hid something and she well, didn't no, know well, it was well, so this is hilarious. So growing up, uh, we my sisters my two sisters shared a room so that we could have what was called a playroom and this is where we we had our TV and toys and shit like that. And my dad was always like, there's too much crap in here. The kids don't need it. I'm going to throw it all away. And my mom was like, no, don't throw it away. These are the kids' stuff. So what my dad did is with, without anybody knowing, he went in there with garbage bags, took like 70% of the shit out of there, didn't throw the garbage bag away. Just hit in the garage. Hit it, waited for like a month. Nobody noticed. And he goes, you didn't even notice I took 70% yeah. of the stuff out that's there. The first goes, that's time I in the garbage. Yeah, the first time I cleared case. Max's stuff out, that's how I did it. Because I was like, because that was kind of an argument back and forth. And I'm like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to do it. I'm not going to say nothing. And I put it in the garage and mm -hmm. like, and nobody, care. nobody knew. Nobody I know. Isn't that funny? Yeah. So yeah, right. yeah no, I'm good about purging. All right. So let me, let me talk about Felix Gray. Cause that was, that's our, our, our next sponsor, but I have a, a study on blue blockers here that I thought was pretty phenomenal. So this was a randomized trial where they had people wear blue blockers three hours before sleep versus just regular glasses, significant improvement in sleep quality significant, like a hmm. big difference. And this is cool because it's easy. It's so easy to just put on, you don't have to change your electronic habits. You don't have to change your lights. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is three hours before bed, like what they did here in the study is you put on your, you know, whatever your blue blockers, your Felix gray glasses, go about your day. Felix gray doesn't change the color of everything. So they're not red or orange. So you could just enjoy your, your normal day and then go to bed. And how, then you'll get better sleep. How were they in the study? How were they uh, measuring quality of sleep or to show like, what was the marker that was yeah. improved by so much? Was it how long they how slept? Long they how, how quick they fell asleep? Was it all the above? Like, yeah. So sleep diaries. Uh, so people okay. reported. So, you know, what's interesting about this, by the way, is that you can have measures of better sleep if they hook things up to you and you might ne not necessarily perceive them. You don't necessarily perceive better sleep unless it's significant. Right. Yeah. So, you can have better like, you know, REM for sleep and, you know, oh, you went to sleep, you know, 15% faster than before. And the person might be like, eh, I think I'm feeling better. But when people report like, oh my God, I feel way more rested. It's pretty significant. So mm -hmm. this is, th these are the kind of studies I like on this because, okay, great. REM, you know, whatever went up 15%. Like, did the person perceive that? Mm -hmm. Is that like a big deal? On this one with the sleep diaries, it was significant. People how, are like big difference. How consistent are you guys all personally? I'm really Felix Gray is one of the things I do like religiously. So I'm really good about I'm consistent if we don't do the lights down thing, but we're really mm -hmm. good with that. Jessica's like sun goes down, it's candles or dim ass lights, uh no TV, no nothing. And we're good. Now if uh, I put TV on, I might put them on. Yeah, go in spurts. I always notice the difference though. <laughs> like even today, like just memory recall for me and like like what I'm trying to bring up. Like if I haven't had good sleep, yeah. totally affects the way that I communicate. So it's like it's it's frustrating. It, it, it promotes me to incorporate like this ritual and like really get back on track. Yeah, but it does now, do help. You, you do you because you're up late a lot of times looking at work. Well, lately I've been up till midnight the last three nights. Yeah, um, and I have been wearing the glasses. Yeah, there was a while there though I wasn't. I was getting to bed earlier, but uh, I, I I decided I better get back at it. 
I mean, I always I always take little breaks off that where I'm inconsistent with it, but it's a short one for me because I notice it. You notice it. I notice it yeah. right away. It's if you're a, consistent, you notice it when you stop. That's a big mm-hmm. time. That's what I tell because sometimes someone will like I've had we've had people buy them and they'll they'll do them and then they'll be like, Yeah, I don't know. I don't really know it's different. Yeah. I was like, be take consistent for a while. Stay consistent mm-hmm. with it and then remove it and then tell me how you feel. Like that's how I really connected it. Like, mm-hmm. oh wow, this is making a bigger difference than I realized. All right. So I want to give a shout out to a social media page. I know we're doing this. Oh, yeah, you got uh, that was a great idea, Adam, when you came up with it. So um the page is called, let's see, at Barbell Films. Barbell mm-hmm. with one L oh, I don't films know on Instagram. I like so you guys know the kind of stuff I'm into. Mm-hmm. It's uh, old school, old timey. Uh, yeah, it's old school, lifters. old timey. You know, uh, you know. Is there any spaces bodybuilding on, strength? spaces on the at Barbell Films or it's, it was just see, at, at Barbell Films? Yeah, let me see. Maybe it's two. No, no, it's two L's. I'm an idiot. It's two L's at Barbell with two L's Films. I misspelled it. So if you go there, you see like old time strong men, strong women. For example, there's a picture here of Katie Sandwina in 1910. And she's literally she holding, great, dude. she's holding three men in her arms like babies. So she's Crazy. got one guy on one arm and two guys in the other arm. And this is a woman in 1910. This is back when, I mean, gosh, if a woman did anything that involved strength. Oh, uh, I'm a dummy. Was, I was putting AT in front of barbell films. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, don't instead do. of the at symbol? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, like, why can't I find it, dude? So it's cool okay, because it, it. they have in here men, oh, cool. women. It's it's all like another one. There's a, early, it's a female again. Laverie Valet ne, ne, ne Cooper. Her stage name was uh, Charmoyne. This is in 1905. This was a early bodybuild, body, bodybuilder and uh, vaudeville trapeze artist. And they show her flexing her biceps and her back. Remember, this is before supplements, steroids, before anything. It's pretty remarkable stuff. And they'll show like, you know, strength feats and stuff like that. So I like this again because this is before Photoshop, this is before oh, yeah. you know they're doing crazy things with lighting. There's no there's no, no debates on are, are these bodies natural or not. <laughs> they are natural. <laughs> yeah, they didn't even have that it's shit. It's as natural as they could get. I don't even think they had protein powder. Most That's what times. I mean. It's yeah. as natural as you could get right here. Pretty pretty amazing. That's stuff, cool. So. Hey, check this out. There's a company called Joy Mode, and this company was created because the products on the market are terrible, and they knew they could do better. Prescriptions, first of all, come with all sorts of side effects, but Joy Mode makes natural and science-based wellness products for men, specifically for men. Go check them out. Go to usejoymode.com forward slash mind pump, and then use the code mind pump at checkout for 20% off your order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Will from Georgia. Will, what's happening, man? How can we help you? How you guys doing? Appreciate you having me on. Yeah, man. Thanks for calling. Uh, so basically, uh, I'm in a predicament kind of, I'm currently on a bulk sitting at about 170, trying to get to 180, 190. Um, however, I'm starting law enforcement training here pretty soon, which is heavy, heavy cardio, intense cardio. So I was just curious on how I could balance like building muscle and gaining weight, but at the same time having to do tons of cardio. Yeah, that's a, that's a mm. tough one because there's kind of uh, competing signals going on. But really your best strategy, first off, would be appropriate strength training. So if you're doing a, like a lot of cardiovascular type training, then maybe one day a week of strength training would be what you'd want to stick to because too much strength training on top of lots of cardio will really burn your body out. And then the second piece, and this is the most important. Stay fed. Yeah, you got to eat more. Yeah. You got to eat. You just got to really feed yourself. And, and if you're not gaining weight, that means you're not eating enough. And there are strategies – to help yourself uh, with something like this. For example, you could add like, I don't know if you can have dairy, but a glass of whole milk with each meal will add like six, 700 calories right there. But you, you got to lift weights appropriately, meaning in the context of what you're currently doing, and then really feed yourself. And it's, it's, it's you know, especially when you're doing lots and lots of cardio, the feeding yourself is going to be like an all day, you know, consistent everyday thing. Otherwise, it's going to be hard to put on any size. This is going to sound like... Uh kind of contradicting advice that we normally give to people as far as like health, right? Uh, that I think helped me a lot because I, I remember playing basketball and trying to do this at the same time. And the first kind of hack that I had was loading up with a sugar drink before I played and then having another one afterwards. So I'd have like something. And by the way, I'm not, there's better healthy choices, but I'm just going to tell you what I did. Just being honest. I had a, a like a sugar loaded rock star, like 
380 calorie rock star before I went and played basketball. And then afterwards I'd have like a thousand calorie Jamba juice. And that right there, like as long as I, I, I had it before and after I did this like intense hour to two hours of like cardio seemed to like mitigate the muscle loss of, and keep my calorie intake high. And it was easy for me because it was liquid to get in there in, in addition. So I ate like I normally would all my my meat and rice type of meals. And then if I knew I was going to do intense cardio for an hour or more, I would hit a sugar drink before and after. And that really helped. Are you able to pick the type of cardio you're doing or is this just like mandatory? Like you have it all prescribed already. Uh, for the training, it's mandatory, which is mostly just running. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's also like some, I guess, body weight things like burpees and like calisthenics type of things. Mm. Um, currently, I'm just riding the bike and like walking up hills with a, a heavy pack on. But um, pretty here soon, it's going to be just strictly like long runs. Yeah. How, yeah. how many days a week are they making you do all this? I don't know exactly yet, but if I had to gauge, probably three or four. Okay. I'm going to send you. Do you have maps on a bollock wheel? I do not. No. Okay. Let me send you maps anabolic. And I would suggest that you follow one foundational workout a week. If you're, if the cardio that they're doing with you is let's say two days a week, then I can do, then you can do two days of foundational workouts. But if you're doing three, <coughs> if it's three hard cardio days and just do one. Okay. Yeah. Now, okay. now there's another program that I think would also benefit you, which would be maps 15. Um, this is, you know, 15 minutes a day of some, some strength training or 20 minutes. If you do the advanced version today, that would, that's going to be a great routine to, to carry you through when you do become a law enforcement officer, uh, because it's every single day. It's short. It's easy to stay consistent. It's not a ton of stress on the body and you still see strength gains. I mean, I, I was able to hit a PR mm -hmm. in deadlifts, uh, training this particular way. So, uh, but maps anabolic is the one I'll send you. Cause I think, I think one of those foundational workouts a week will work well with what you're currently doing. Awesome. Appreciate that. No problem, man. You got it. And then do you take any supplements? Uh, creatine and then pre-workout sometimes. Yeah, you're set. Creatine was the one I was going to recommend you're set. Aside from things that can add extra calories like protein shakes yeah. or, or, you know, gainer shakes. And I know I just recommended gainer shakes, but I think in this case that might actually help. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been, I've been bulking for, I guess, two months now and a lot of protein shakes, creatine, like I said, rice, chicken, beef, the whole essentials, basically. Good deal. All right, man. Yeah, as much fast twitch uh, cardio as you can do. I know, like they'll probably have you do like long endurance runs, but uh, you know, if you if you can change and 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 structure it in a way that you you know have control over, I would do you know focus a little bit more on hit or like sprints to to try and preserve muscle. Yeah, it's more muscle sparing for sure. Right, right. All right, man. Well, thanks right for calling on. in. Awesome. Appreciate you guys. You got it, bro. Well. Thank yep. you. You know, at the end of the day. Um, weight gain or weight loss. Now I'm not saying necessarily muscle or fat. Okay. Because that's, then it gets more complicated, but just weight, you know, you eat more, you eat less. And yeah. if you're not gaining, you got to eat more and you can definitely gain weight while doing tons and tons of cardio. Now the muscle aspect that can make it real tricky because you can gain body fat and do lots of cardio. If you're not sending the right muscle building signal, or if you're overdoing the cardio, nonetheless, the calorie piece of this equation is I think where people miss because mm -hmm. they're like, Oh, I can't gain any weight. I can't gain any weight. And it's like, well, you know, jump your calories up 500 or a thousand and then watch what happens. And it, it's true. It's an, it's an energy, you know, in versus energy out thing. And it works every single time. You just might not be eating as much as you think. It's really interesting how, whether you're trying to increase calories or reduce calories, how our body has this like homeostasis yeah. and anything outside of that is hard. Uh -huh. Like I don't care what you're trying to do. And I, and I think in a case like this, which is why I gave crazy advice of like sugar drinks and Jamba juice, because I understand when you go from somebody who like is almost probably force feeding or really focused on eating a ton of calories just to get yourself in a normal bulk. Yep. And then all of a sudden you start yep. running every day for an hour or whatever like that. Totally. Drastic change. It's huge. And, and, and it was already hard for you to hit that calorie intake as it is. And then now your body is demanding an extra three to 500 more every single day. And, you know, maybe you have one or two days where you, you're good and you hit it, but then you go back down to normal, especially if you're not tracking and paying attention. Yeah, and so. along those lines, uh, when it comes to gaining, if it's challenging for you to get enough calories for whatever reason. This right here, what I'm about to say makes a massive difference. 
Start your day off with a high calorie breakfast. What yeah. you don't want to do is end up around noon or 1 p.m. Trying to play catch up. And yeah, and you're behind the eight ball because um, then it sucks. It really does suck. But if you start with like a big breakfast um, and, you know, choose foods that are easy to digest, right? You don't want to be bloated all day, but eat a big breakfast. Um, that makes a huge difference. Our next caller is Landon from North Carolina. Landon, what's happening? How can we help you? Fellas, how we doing this morning? Doing good, man. Good. Doing good. Right on. Appreciate you guys taking the time to talk with me. I uh, got a question for y'all, but before I dive into that, just want to say the you know, obligatory thank you. Um, you know, after years of hammering myself in the gym and uh, you know, not really knowing why I was plateauing, uh, finally feeling like I can get some concrete truth and real information from you guys. Uh, so truly appreciate what you do. Um, thank you. I've also introduced you to some of my family. Uh, shout out my brother-in-law, Neil Wagstaff. He's running uh, Anabolic right now and loving it. Um, awesome. right. Got my wife running Starter too, so she's a big fan of that. Trying to convince her of the reverse diet, but struggling a little bit there. But uh, we'll, we'll get her soon. Excellent. Um, awesome. So just uh, some quick background. I'll try to make it quick. Uh, I know you guys are busy. Played basketball in college. Did a lot of explosive movements, cleans, squats, that type of thing. Never really bulked to try to put on size. Um, when, once I finally graduated, um, I did try to go on kind of a bro split, bulked a lot, um, put on muscle pretty rapidly. Um, within the first eight weeks or so, uh, I gained probably 30 pounds on my bench press, got some you know stretch marks on my chest, hard earned stretch marks there. Um, you know, gained way too much weight, though. Uh, I did a dirty, dirty bulk, um, you know, eating McDoubles, washing it down with a Pop-Tart smoothie. I mean, I was getting after it. Um, so put on way too much fat, but also gained muscle incredibly fast. Uh, stopped working out about a year after that for the next five years. Got back into it um, during COVID and um, did, you know, bulks and cuts on and off from there. Most recently did a cut down to about seven and a half percent body fat. And it worked my way up to about 10% now. <clears throat> um, running anabolic, loving it, amazing program. Um, got some more of your programs as well. I plan on starting. But my question is the I'm doing a clean bulk right now, and my muscle gain, while it's happening, I'm gaining strength, gaining muscle. I can see it. It's still not as fast as that initial dirty bulk I did five or six years ago. And I'm wondering if there's any science around, you know, I know long-term dirty, dirty bulks are a, a poor strategy, but in eight weeks or so, scientifically, do you put on more muscle mass uh, doing a dirty bulk? Or was that just a one-off thing where all the factors might've been right in my life where I gained muscle that quickly? All right. That's a cool question. Yeah. So, okay. There's a couple of things we want to consider with this. One is you're, you were a collegiate athlete. And uh, at that level of sports, you, you're you're on the on the the I don't know the better end of genetics when it comes to <laughs> muscle building. So your body is going to build more muscle probably faster than most average people. So that you've got that going for you. Okay, so let's consider that. Number two, eating a in a dirty bulk, especially initially, probably will put on a little bit more muscle. The challenge though is uh, when you measure lean body mass, that's also measuring uh, water. And you tend to hold more glycogen, more water with more calories. That's considered lean body mass because it's not body fat. So sometimes it's hard to separate. And I know there's like body fat tests and stuff, but they're not super necessarily accurate with that. And then the other thing to consider is, okay, let's say you could gain 10 pounds uh, with a cleaner bulk. And let's say eight pounds of that is muscle, or you could gain 15 pounds, but you know nine or 10 pounds of it is muscle. Is that really a, a worthy trade-off? I mean- if you're starting off at 6% body fat, maybe, because you don't really care about adding extra body fat at that point. But for a lot of people, it's not worth it because then when they go and they try to back out, they end up losing that extra pound or two that they gained uh, eating all that stuff. And then, of course, there's the health implications. It's just not healthy for your body. Now, you're young, so you're probably not going to see a lot in that way. But as you get older, you may notice that eating that way, it's just not going to start. It's not going to work for your body. You're going to notice issues with your health. Maybe long-term digestive issues can start to become an issue. I know I suffered from those uh, because of the way I would, you know, quote unquote, bulk uh, when I was younger. And then lastly, you will see more strength oftentimes with more body fat gain. <clears throat> and that has to do with energy. It has to do with leverage. CNS uh, output might be better. That's why powerlifters tend to carry more body, body fat um, and find that they're stronger. 
uh, in doing so. And so that can mess with you a little bit. Like I've done this where I've gained more weight, maybe not as much more muscle, but a lot more body fat, but my strength was a lot higher. Like what's the value of that? I don't know. Um, you know, it depends if I was competing, I guess, in, in an open weight class, I might be okay. Or if I like to, you know, have certain PR numbers just for my own ego, that might be okay. But as I've gotten older and trained more people, I just see they're just, there's just more value in trying to minimize fat gain than there is in just trying to gain as much as possible, unless I'm dealing with someone who's super shredded, in which case gaining some body fat is uh, is a good idea. You also have to consider that when you dirty bulk, right, we, we tend to be in, in way more calories than we, we necessarily need to in order to, to, to bulk. And what you potentially do when you do that is actually add fat cells to the body, which makes it increasingly more difficult when you go back to cut, cutting. So this was like really common in the bodybuilding world I and with my peers. So in, in, with my peers, I would see like my, some of my buddies would, they'd be in the bulk part of getting ready for a show and they would just eat everything in sight. And I'd see him put on 30, 50 pounds, you know, all to try and cut that back. And what I'd see would happen is every time they go to back to a cut, you know, for the next show, it was increasingly more difficult for them to yeah. get as lean as they had did before doing the same stuff, doing just as much cardio, dieting the same way, and they would be confused and it'd be like, man, what, what's happening is every time you go back to this bulk, you bulk so aggressively, your body's got to be adding fat cells, and so you're making it that much more difficult for you to lean out. Also, back to kind of what Sal was saying, there is like a, you know, there is a little bit of deception there on how much muscle you're putting on because when you're dirty bulk and you're in that many calories you're you're filled up with extra water you're filled up with extra glycogen so the muscle bellies look filler like so you look like you're you're putting on more and i know be, coming from being a, a skinny kid who was trying to build how that psychologically can fuck with you a little bit like oh man this is this is yeah. working i feel better but then it's it's just that much more difficult when you cut and then when you cut what ends up happening you have to cut so hard to get off that increase that extra body fat you put on, you end up with the same amount of muscle or sometimes even a little bit less when you get back to the desired body fat percentage that you want. And so what I have found works really well is, okay, I want a clean bulk, but then when I'm a leaner guy, if I carry myself at six to 10% type of body fat, hey, when I go out on Friday night with my wife and we eat, like I'm not gonna trip out if I have some dessert or, so I'm gonna enjoy. so. In that sense, I, I I would you know I wouldn't call it like there's a, some flexibility. There, yeah, right? exactly. That's I'm not wouldn't call it like a dirty bulk, but then I'm also not really worried too much. I keep myself relatively lean. I eat most of my calories through good choices of food. But hey, it's Friday night with my wife, and I'm in a bulk anyways. So tonight I'm gonna have that pizuki after I have that yeah. steak and rice or whatever like that. So to me, that's that's how I would allow some of that flexibility of allowing some of those quote unquote dirty foods into the diet. Uh, but not go like giving that as an excuse of like, oh, now I'm eating pop tart smoothies and I'm eating, you know, sour patch candy kids all the like that type of shit. That's only going to make it more difficult for you when you go back to lean out. I wouldn't do things like that, but I, I would give yourself some flexibility in your normal eating. Yeah, and, and Landon, let me rephrase your question, because what, what we're kind of presenting right now is a is a bit of a false binary or dichotomy, which is, you know, eat clean bulk, not as many calories, or eat a dirty bulk with more calories. Here's the real comparison that we want to look at. Same amount of calories, okay? So both in a bulk, even if it's an excessive bulk, but one of them is made up of foods that are more whole, natural, not fast food, not candy, not what would be considered garbage. The other one includes fast food, candy, garbage. Now I'm going to tell you from that standpoint, because I've done both and I've trained people who've done both, the whole natural, quote unquote, healthier version, even though the calories are the same, builds more muscle. It just builds more muscle. The other one tends to gain more body fat. So even if your goal is to just gain as much muscle as possible and you're like, I'm going to just eat way more calories, you're still better off doing it with calories that come from foods that don't mess with your, your palate sensitivity, that don't mess with your dopamine, that don't mess with your insulin, foods that are on the healthier side. Now you can do this with you know calorically dense healthier foods like you can get ground beef 80% 80% ground beef mix it with some rice make your rice with bone broth you got yourself a high calorie bowl of rice and bone broth and you know fatty ground beef throw in some vegetables if you want some fiber right you can if you can have dairy whole milk have a glass of whole milk with every meal 
there's some good, you know, dense calories that you're going to get. It's not soda. It's not garbage. It's not, you know, crap, right? So those are just a couple examples of ways you can add calories with foods that are better for your body. And like I said, when you go apples to apples, 3,500 calories, 3,500 calories, or 4,000 calories, 4,000 calories, but one of them is, you know, more what, what we would consider healthier, better options, you gain more muscle that way. That's my experience. That's been my experience across the board. And people just feel better too. Like uh, dirty bulks yeah. with crappy food just feel like shit, you know? Um, <laughs> and that's that's another trade-off I don't think is worth it. <clears throat> right, right. Uh, I guess uh, just a quick follow-up on that. And I appreciate the information. That makes a lot of sense. Um, just in terms of, and, and again, I know this can vary so widely depending on the person and all kinds of factors, but just to try to tamper my expectations for muscle growth and when to expect to see size increase. I mean, a rough estimation, does that take three months? Does it take six to nine months or is it hard to really tell? Yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to tell. Um, I would guess, like I said, because of your level of, of, uh, cause you were an athlete at a pretty high level, you're probably going to build muscle faster than the average person. How tall are you and what's your body weight? You said you're 10% body fat right now. I'm six five two oh five at about ten percent. All right, so two oh five at six five. You know, boy, I think you could probably get up to two twenty two twenty five with uh, okay. right around the body fat you're at now, with probably a year and a half of good consistent okay. training. I would. I, that's. I'm going to give you a guess. Now, here's the deal. I could be totally off because genetics make a big difference. But I'm hitting. You know, you're hitting all cylinders, getting good sleep. You're eating good. You're hitting a surplus with your calories. You're getting stronger. You're not losing sleep because you just had a baby or whatever. I know you said you're married, so everything going mm -hmm. great. I mean, you could probably gain a good 15 pounds of lean body mass within a year and a half, two years uh, of consistent, you know, doing it that way. And how, you know, old, how old are you right now? I'm 31. Okay. Well, yeah. Good years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Those are, those are good building years. Yeah. For sure. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, really appreciate it guys. That's uh that's very encouraging to know. And, uh, excited about it. I've got anabolic now. i um, going to hopefully run through performance uh, aesthetic. And then I've got uh, powerlifting strong. So that's oh, going to yeah. be my year's worth of program. Oh, yeah. so. You got it. Are you doing prime or prime pro to help with the mobility issues? Because when you're packing on muscle like that, um, yep. you want to make sure you maintain, you know, mobility. Yep. I've got prime. Um, so I'm using that every single workout definitely awesome. can immediately feel the difference, especially my ankles and hips, um, when I squat. So Good deal. Uh, that's been a game changer, especially when you're tall, like you are. So I'm going to send you prime pro just cause it gets, it gets a little deeper. So I'll send you that for free. And then a good program to follow up with some of these would be symmetry, uh, especially with, uh, with someone tall like you, the unilateral stuff tends to work really, really well with somebody who's got long limbs. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. I didn't expect that. So I really appreciate it and look forward to putting that in the routine. You got right, it, man. man. Mm -hmm. Thanks for calling in. All right. Take care. No problem. Yeah. You guys remember, well, I don't think Justin ever had to deal with this, but, uh, <laughs> I don't <laughs> Justin, know. what are you going to say? Justin's gaining muscle right now. Just us talking about it. But yeah, true. I know Adam and I, we've gone through this process. Do you yeah. remember when you, when you piece together, like, Oh, if I eat like a lot of calories and make it like whole natural food, I just build more muscle. Yeah. I mean, it just blew, it well, just blew me away. Yeah. I wanted to add to that, like in terms of like building more muscle through like whole foods. So there has to be a factor to that if you have gastrointestinal issues. Because yes, this is something oh, I did go through, right, with just pounding a bunch of shakes and just eating whatever I possibly could just for the calorie sake, uh, but really not being able to assimilate a lot of it. And a lot of it just went through me, you know, with diarrhea, with gas, everything else. So yep. it's like, you know, you got to consider that's a factor. Yeah, well, no, there's that. There's the, You feel like crap. You're probably not going to work out as well. You're probably not going to sleep as well. There's also the the behaviors around your food choice too. So like one of the things that I remember when I was allowing myself to quote unquote dirty bulk and just kind of eat whatever, right? Just to get extra calories. When I, when I did a, an assessment on what I was consuming, it was like, okay, sure. I was hitting 4,000, 5,000 calories, but most of it came from carbohydrates or sat saturated fat. And I was still not hitting my protein intake That's true. Mm -hmm. because I would gravitate towards these, you know, snacky type foods and desserts and candies. And they're just, always heavy carbs. Yeah, yeah. They're all heavy carbs and I'm not getting, I'm not even getting quality protein from there. And then I, I look at my thing and I'll be like, Oh shit, I had 120 grams of protein today, but I had 4,000 calories because yep. it was all in like carbs and sugar and shit like that. So, you know, that's the other thing that I, I don't like about the process of dirty bulking is that, it kind of gives people this pass of like, oh, I just eat everything in sight, and then and then hopefully I hit my my you know targets, my macro targets. But then when you go back and you actually track it all, you're like, oh wow, I tend to gravitate towards because honestly, eating 
especially for a guy like this, six five, yeah, eating eating enough calories to put on size for a guy that that tall and lanky and yeah, an athlete. Is chore. Oh man, probably four or five thousand calories, and yeah, easy. doing that through steak and potatoes and chicken yeah. or i mean that's hard so yeah. you so you tend to throw in these calories to try and get it get up over that number and then you realize like oh shit i'm eating just a bunch of pop tarts and stuff just at that calorie you know what's tank. interesting the athletes the traditional athletes of the world who have really figured out how to gain lots of weight uh sumo wrestlers and mm. if you look at and sumo has been around for a long time there's a traditional dish that sumo wrestlers would eat to gain weight. I don't remember the name of it. Maybe Doug can find it, but it, it's a, it's a type of a soup and it's a high calorie soup and the sumo wrestlers. And remember these guys don't mind getting body fat. Obviously they want to be huge, but they also have to be mobile. They have to move. If you've ever watched sumo wrestlers, you know, fight, they're actually incredibly mobile for guys, their size, super explosive, very <laughs> for guys that, you know, 500 pounds, 400 pounds, like they can move. And this soup, what's the soup called, Doug? Chanko Nabe. Chanko Nabe. And they will say, these are these are guys that just want to put on size. They will say, avoid junk food. And they've been, this is something that's been around for a long time. So, uh, you know, eating whole natural foods and gaining weight uh, makes you feel better. That's just the bottom line. Our next caller is Drew from Nebraska. Drew, what's happening? How can we help you? Awesome. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for having me on, taking the time to uh, answer my questions. Uh, obligatory thank you for everything uh, you do. Uh, I've been listening about a year and where I'm at right now compared to then, it's it's very different. So thank you very much. You got it. Sweet. Uh, just going to go ahead and jump in. I have a couple of questions about uh, nutrition. Um, my life has changed a little bit. I had a little bit more flexible of a schedule. Uh, I was used to working out more after work, early afternoon. Um, and now I am working out first thing in the morning. Uh, so 6 a.m. I'm uh, in the gym going at it and I'm kind of having trouble uh, with my morning nutrition. Uh, even now, when I occasionally work out in the afternoon, I'm uh, more well fed. I have chance a chance to eat a couple meals. Um, I don't know if this is a thing where I'm just kind of chasing my tail uh, in the convenience of working out in the morning. Um, I just have to kind of deal with not being as well fed and not being quite, uh, you know, ready to go, but I didn't know if you had any advice for, uh, where I should be kind of putting my meals. Um, if I should be really eating anything beforehand, uh, you guys have anything for me there? Yeah. What, back what, back what, low carbs at night. What, well, yeah, he wrote that actually too. He says he eats a pretty good meal before bed. What time do you wake up? You work out at six. What time do you wake up? Uh, 5 a.m. I try to get up a little bit and move around before I, I head out that way. But, you know, if, if I'm eating anything significant, I, I'm not going to really have time to digest it. No. Yeah. So plus is with morning workouts. It's the people tend to be more consistent. It tends to set the tone for the day. Uh, minuses, your performance isn't going to be as good. And studies are going to show this across the board. Look, I've been working out first thing in the morning for years. So my body's acclimated to an extent. But even now, even after years and years of training in the morning, if I wanted to just max out my strength and look at my best performance, I'd do better off in the afternoon. This is just how it is. So you got to kind of deal with that and be okay with it. But as far as meals are concerned, you just eat right after you're done and bring your breakfast with you. This will make it a lot easier. That's what I do. So I eat, uh, you know, what I eat every morning to everybody's uh, demise and complaints is I have eight uh, hard boiled eggs. Mm. So right after my workout, I eat eight hard-boiled eggs, and there's my first meal, and I get my proteins, my fats, and everything feels great. So fumes everywhere. Yeah. So I would say, I would say, uh, bring your breakfast with you, so that right after you're done, you can just eat. What time are you finished with your workout? Uh, usually by seven thirty or so. I'm yeah. Usually just an hour and a half. Yeah. This is where the creatures of habit sick, bro. You oh could yeah. Eat, well, you that's either, super convenient. You could call. either throw that in cold water and shake it up and actually drink it like a shake. I've actually had it's bomb like that, or you have like a thing where you can boil it, throw hot water on it. It's good. But I, so I would, ex I would experiment too. I don't know how much you've tracked, like what, what the, the, the calories and carbohydrates that you have for dinner. Um, but I, I would experiment with that. Like actually like really loading up at nighttime. If I really load up at nighttime, uh, come morning time, I've I've still got enough fuel in the tank to actually feel a decent workout. Although I hate morning workouts, so it's, I'm not a fan of them for the reasons that you're explaining right now. It's just not my thing. I don't. 
I don't like to feel as weak as Sal is, and I just think that <laughs> training in the after- as weak as I was. Training in the, in the afternoon <laughs> keeps Justin and I much stronger than him. So uh, for us, <laughs> we prefer that. But yeah. you know, as far, videos, he lot, is lot more consistent, videos. though. You know, he is more consistent than we are. So that I mean, he's got that going for him. So <laughs> no, I, I, try that. Try loading some carbohydrates. I think try, trying to get something before that's not going to happen. And and then Sal's point, eat right after. I love creatures of habit for something like that. It's easy di- to digest. It's got thirty something grams of protein protein in it. It tastes good. Like that's a great post workout type of meal that you can have, but really, really try playing around with like having like a high, high carb dinner and, and see what that does. As long as it doesn't disrupt sleep. Um, I, I would, I would play around with that. You know what I realized too, is that, uh, cause you're just lifting, right? That's all you're doing in the morning. It's not like you're doing a crazy long-term cardio workout or anything like that. Okay. So, cause I was going to say, if you're doing like real high intensity, long, you know, kind of steady state type cardio type workout, you might want to have a carbohydrate drink with you while you're training, but for weight training, not necessary. Um, here's what I figured out a long time ago is that I would, I would have like this really crappy performance in the, in the morning workout. And then about halfway through my workout, I would start to feel better. And I started to realize it's because I was, didn't drink water. So as soon as you wake up, drink like two glasses of water. Um, and, and that makes a big difference. Cause what I would do is I'd wake up early, I'd get ready, brush my teeth, do the whole thing and then start my workout and then start drinking water while I was working out and 20, 30 minutes in, I started to feel better. And so now what I do, as soon as I wake up, I go and I have two big glasses of water, uh, about an hour before 45 minutes before I work out. And that made a huge difference. So try that out too. Got it. I, I had a gut feeling you were going to bring up creatures of habit. I'm intolerant to oats. Oh, so a little rough there, but, uh, I've been mainly my carb meals are first thing post-workout. And then I've been trying to do more before bed. Should I just put everything before bed? Like go just hard on that or just post-workout really? Uh, he said experiment. Much. I think what Adam said is ideal. You yeah. Experiment. Yeah. Play with it. I don't like, I don't know where you're at. If you've actually counted carbohydrates and seen like, Oh, you know, cause you, people will say like, Oh, I have a big dinner. I said, okay, well, what's a big dinner? Oh, well I and track it for me. And then you go, Oh, I eat 40 grams of protein and I have a hundred grams of carbs. And then I go, okay, let's try 200 grams of carbs for dinner and see what happens. So th- that's what I mean. Figure out kind of where you're at currently right now, increase it by 50% or more. Uh, and see how that affects your workout in the morning if you notice a difference. And so long as you digest that amount of carbohydrates fine, you sleep okay, if it if it improves performance, that may be an answer for you is to start to totally. backload carbo, uh, carbohydrates like that. Perfect. And then if, there, if we still have time, I had one other uh, part to kind of the nutrition side. I, uh, I was in an extended deficit for... The better part of two years. Uh, I lost about 120 pounds wow. Wow. Um, from 2020 till more recently. Um, in that time, I don't think I was probably in a surplus for more than maybe a month of that whole time. Uh, right now I'm in a bulk. I've been in a bulk since October and I was planning on just going until about February and then around summertime, kind of cutting back down. I've heard you guys talk about, um, being in an extended deficit like that, maybe living in a bulk a little bit longer. And so I feel pretty good, but I just didn't know if you had any, you know, any more input on that, on how long I should really be staying. I, I would interrupt it with many one week cuts. Yeah. And so, then you can bulk for a long time that way. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you know, your plan is to bulk all the way till like February, whatever. Okay. So just, you know, every, every fourth week, and it doesn't even have to be a full week, to be honest with you, every fourth week run three to four days of really low calorie. And then go back. So just interrupt it like that every every three to four weeks with a three to four days of of a low ca- low cal, and then go back the other direction. I think you'll you'll feel a lot better, and you'll you'll see a better response. Now to add to that, in my experience, one of the best ways to do that is to go three to four days of, of very low carbohydrates. It's an easy way to cut calories yeah. during that period of time, and uh, you end up you know you're maintaining the essential fats and, and proteins. Perfect. All right, man. Well, cool. hey, good job on the 120 pound weight loss. Yeah, That's phenomenal. Dude. Yeah, and the fact that you're able psychologically to go in a bulk. That's actually really, di- it, really it, difficult. It's, it's tough. Uh, yeah, especially putting the carbs back on. Uh, seeing the scale go up, and I mean, my muscles are fuller, but just everything else is a little, 
a little rough here or there, but gay, gay, good for you, bro. That takes a lot. It. it takes a lot of discipline to do that. That's probably one of the most difficult things I had with clients that lost that kind of weight was to. They were so afraid of. That's right. Them. To yeah. be able to, to to do what you're doing. So you're you're doing the right thing. So keep it up. Awesome. Thank you. You yep. got it, man. Right on. Yeah, that's a. Uh, um, you know, as far as the morning workouts are concerned, there's going to be trade-offs. Of and course. I think this is where people have the challenge. Mm -hmm. But look, my argument is always going to be this with it is, um, you know, it, it does make the day better. You tend to have more energy throughout the day. You tend to st you start your day off on the right foot because you're like motivated. You push yourself. You have a great workout. So it tends to help with work. It tends to help with the rest of the day. You tend to be more consistent. And I think for a lot of people, it's not everybody, but for a lot of people, when you weigh that out and you add in the, okay, yes, my performance is 5% worse than my workouts, it's still worth it. It's a net positive. You know, I'll add one more thing that it does too, even though I, I hate morning workouts and I wish I would be better about it, is you get better sleep. Yeah. Because you start- You don't have your caffeine so late. You start so early. Uh -huh. You have your caffeine earlier. You you have a longer day. So then when, when the sun naturally goes down, you're already kind of exhausted. Totally. One of the drawbacks of being a, a, a late riser and a late workout person as I am is, you know, nine ten o'clock at night, I'm still wired yep, sometimes yep. And, and when wanting to stay up where- when I do and have disciplined myself to get up and train at like six in the morning, shit, sun goes down and I'm already yawning and I'm ready to go to bed. Yeah. And then I tend to get really good sleep. So there are definitely those benefits, but I, you know, I drag ass in the workout. It's mm -hmm. tough to, to power through it. And so I there's mean, always trade-offs. Yeah. You know, I just, you got to look at the whole picture is what I tend to tell people. But if I could work out at the best time for performance for me it would be like noon. Mm -hmm. It's just, I'd lift at noon, but I mean, there's no way I'll be able to make that happen. I'm not going to be as consistent. Um, and, you know, before noon, you we tend to record two podcasts. And I like to come in here after my workout and record. I'm just sharper. I feel better. So just works out better for, for me. And I know a lot of people like that. So our next caller is Colton from Utah. Colton, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, how are you guys? Good, Good. man. Good. So I have two questions. Um, my first question is I'm trying to find a balance between like, a bodybuilding and a powerlifting workout. Um, I tend to find myself leaning naturally more towards like some of the powerlifting type stuff, the heavy compound lifts, but I want to also get the benefit of building muscle, like in a bodybuilding type workout. So is there a way that you can incorporate both of those into the same training session or would it be more efficient to, like cycle in a powerlifting phase and then a bodybuilding phase. Yeah, it's a common question. Well, first mm -hmm. off, I want to correct what you said. They both build muscle. Okay, yeah. so whether you're training and they both build a lot of muscle too. By the yeah, way, yeah. So there's a myth that oh, one builds you know more than the other. I mean, if you cycle them properly, you're going to get better results than if you just stick to one uh, all the time. So this is a question we get often. Now, um, in terms of like results. In the studies, when people are monitored and told what to do, it doesn't matter. If you do, you know, a heavy workout on Monday, a lighter, higher rep workout on Wednesday, and so on. But in our experience, it's better to do a cycle of a specific type of training for a few weeks and then move into another cycle of a specific type of training, mainly because there's a different mindset with the training. And you, and you know this, right? When you do three reps sure. of a squat – versus, you know, 12 reps of a squat, it's a different focus, right? On one of them, it's all about the movement. It's keeping tight. You hold your breath when you do your lift. The other one, it's like smooth, focus on the muscles, the contraction, the stretch, the squeeze, the pump. And that's a hard mindset to mm -hmm. get in and out of, okay? It's hard sure, for me to yeah. do. It's hard for me to do, and I've been training for a long time. So I prefer being in the mindset of I'm trying to train for strength, for the next three weeks. And then I'm trying to train in more have a hypertrophy, you know, style for the next three to four weeks. What ends up happening is I pick too much weight for my bodybuilding style workouts, or I end up focusing too much on the squeeze and the pump or the lack of the pump mm -hmm. when I'm doing the powerlifting workouts. But if I'm in that mindset, then that's where I'm at. 
and it's all good. So it's more of a psychological yeah, thing. It's than a anything. lot easier to acknowledge uh, the intent going in uh, and to be able to refine and, and fine tune what you're doing in terms of your overall technique, especially if you can place that kind of emphasis on technique, while, especially while you're power lifting, because it requires so much dedicated focus. Uh, I would highly suggest kind of staying in that for a bit. Plus it's more measurable. So that's the thing is when you start like combining different methods, it's really hard to kind of tease out. Out, uh, what really is working the best and what isn't. So uh, just in terms of those two points, uh, you know, I would I would try to to cycle them both at different times. The main point I would have brought up is what J Justin just said. I think that that's the most important thing is that I was notorious for this. Like I, I trained like all the modalities in one. It was like every I used to my in fact, my philosophy was as a trainer, I've never repeated the same workout. Every workout was unique and different because to Sal's point, that's what the studies show. Like the studies show that if you're if if you're con if you're continuously moving and changing rep ranges and and exercises and and modalities, like the body's going to keep adapting and responding, and it's just as good as somebody who's like cycling and phasing. But here's the drawback of that: is it's really hard to Justin's point to measure. Well, what's really working for my body? Like, oh, when I train these exercises in this manner, wow, I really notice X, Y, and Z. Like. Uh, and and you can see that because you're sticking to something very consistently for three to four weeks and you're not sprinkling in other things. Otherwise, you go, you look back after two months of kind of sprinkling a little bit of everything and you're like, oh, shit. Yeah, I definitely put on some good size. Oh, what was that from? Was that from my powerlifting training that I was doing or was that do more from the bodybuilding stuff I was doing? Like, And so it's harder to tease out. What what is your body really responding to? And so we tend to lean and push people more. And by the way, there's I think it's Mike O'Hearn who who's oh, the coined, power building. Yeah, who's coined the power building program where he combines power lifting with bodybuilding and mm -hmm. and really that's a marketing tool to to appeal to someone just like you who goes like, Oh, I like powerlifting and I want to look like a bodybuilder. Like this is the perfect program for me. Like, okay, sure. But it really is, in our opinion, better and more beneficial for you to focus on a phase, a way of training, run, run and work, run a program like power lift mm -hmm. for a while, then run a program like split like we have. In fact, do you have any of our programs? I actually don't know. OK, so I, I mean, are you more into the, the power lifting or the bodybuilding? Which one do you enjoy the most right now? Myself, I enjoy the power lifting more. And I think that's just because, like you guys said, it's measurable and you can see the increase. You yeah. can see the results a lot faster. Yeah. So I'm gonna have I'm gonna have Doug send you over power lift and then I would follow that up with map split. I think those the in combination of running one and then running the next program, you'll get the the, the benefits that you're looking for. Yeah, and one more thing I'd like to add here is that I think that I don't want to discount the self-awareness um, and knowing your body or learning your body as you go through this journey of, of exercise. And I think you learn better and faster when you can stay in a focused modality for a few weeks versus mixing it all up. You also can experience one of my favorite things. And I don't, like I said, if you looked at this over the course of a year, I don't think the results necessarily would be better. Uh, however, there's something to be said about the psychological benefit of going for three, four weeks in a, in a modality, then switching and seeing like these really rapid changes in that first week or two. Like when I switch from, you know, 12 to 15 reps to three to five reps in that first two to three weeks, it's like, boom, I see great, but then it slows down. And then I switch to something else versus kind of this real slow, consistent pro. I like that. Like, I like the way that feels. I also like knowing how my body feels and how it feels different when I train differently. And I can notice signs and signals in my body. For example, when I power lift for too long, I feel it in my joints. When I bodybuild for too long, I just feel burnt out. And it's a different feeling. Both of them are different feelings. So it would be hard for me to pinpoint what's going on if I did it all at the same time. So you'll see when you look at our programs, how they're phased. Mm -hmm. We don't mix yeah. everything up at once. We, we, we tend to phase them that way. So you get in power lift. And then after that, I think split would be a good, a good follow-up for you for sure. No, that's awesome. I'm excited to try those. You got it. Um, my second question, I kind of went down the intermittent fasting rabbit hole pretty far. Um, I did it pretty religiously for about two years, lost a bunch of weight. It was great. Um, and now that I have started lifting more, I'm about 12 weeks into lifting pretty consistently now. I've been trying to incorporate some more meals, some more calories, kind of break out of that intermittent fasting cycle. 
but it's been a, a really, really big challenge for me mentally. And it's hard because I really liked the way that I felt when I was intermittent fasting. It seemed like my body really agreed with that. Um, so do you think there's any room for intermittent fasting in like a muscle building, powerlifting space? I mean, sure. there is. It's, it's, it's it counterproductive. It's just going to be harder. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're trying to eat, you know, I don't know how many calories you're, you're trying to eat here, but if you're trying to eat, you know, 3,500 calories and mm -hmm. your eating window is noon to six, okay, you're going to be stuffing yourself. It's not going to feel very good. Um, so I don't think it's a great uh, way to do it. Can't, I, I, can't. I, would, I would use it as an interrupter, right? So I wouldn't use it as like, a, like what you're referring yeah. to, like every day having this eating window and trying to do it. Like, good luck with that. I think then that is kind of counterproductive. But- if you're like consistently eating four to six meals a day all day long and you've been doing that for a week or two and you're like, hey, you know what? This weekend I'm going to intermittent fast yeah. because I just feel like I'm, I'm feeling a little lethargic or maybe I a little I overdid it on on Friday night or whatever like that. So, hey, tomorrow I'm going to intermittent fast. Like that's how I would do it. I would I would interrupt my kind of normal eating routine with an intermittent fast based off of how I felt because you've already said – I feel good on it. It agrees with my body. So when you notice that you've been pushing the food quite a bit and you want to take a break from that, I think that's a great tool. But using intermittent fasting as on a daily basis while also trying to gain strength and so that's that's, tough. that's really tough. And Are that you, is kind of counterproductive. You, what are your benefits that you notice from fasting that you like so much? Um, my mental clarity is 150% better, I would say. Um, my digestive system really agrees with it. Um, less bloated, more consistent energy. Just a general, in general, I feel a lot better well, try, when I intermittent try, fast. And try this. Try carbs. this. Try eating a lower carb bulking diet mm. and then put your carbs around your workout. Yeah. So this is like a cyclic, you know, kind of targeted carbohydrate uh, type of diet. So maybe your carbs are 150 for the day. Uh, or a hundred for the day, which is kind of low for a bulk, especially, you know, I don't know how big you are, but you know, if you're, you know, over 180 pounds, it's real low. I would go carbs before and after my workout. And then the rest of the day it's keto. That was, I mean, I was going to interject that. That was the biggest thing I found was like, it's carbs, calories, like, like how I was going to manage that. Cause I was skipping a lot of breakfast and also, you know, a heavy meal at the end. I, I would skip that too. I had um, the bulk of what I would eat was like, you know, during that window. Uh, mm -hmm. And that took a long time for me to kind of bust through in terms of like, I didn't feel that same kind of strength and energy in my workouts and didn't realize it until I actually started to put work uh, in. And I had to start with like a lot lower calorie intake for breakfast because my body just didn't want to include that. And so it just took some effort, uh, but definitely like the, the timing of it uh, did play quite a bit of a factor where I would add a bit more carbs right before the workout. Out, uh, and then after so you know that's something to play around with yeah would you say there's like a certain range of carbs that i need to be in before a workout or kind of just whatever i feel the best uh, it depends i mean yeah i guess that's the right answer but i would start with like you know start with this right if you feel really good on low carb i would go 50 to 60 grams of carbohydrates about an hour or two before your workout, and then after your workout, your post-workout meal would have about 50 grams of carbohydrates. So there you go, 100, 120 grams of carbs, yeah. and that's it for the day, so it's still low carb. And you might even, depending on how much activity you do and how hard your workouts, you still might even be able to get into ketosis with that. I know I can get into ketosis with about 100 grams of carbohydrates if I'm working out you know, really hard. But look, I don't, look, I, I'm like you, I feel way better eating that way. So, yeah. so what I, if I want to maximize my performance and mental acuity. That's how I do it. I eat my carbs around my workout. That's perfect. Well, I'm going to try that and see how that works for me. You got awesome. it. Man. Yeah. Thanks for calling in, brother. Right. Yeah. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Right. You got it. You know, it's great about, you know, follow, I guess, you know, kind of doing like a fitness journey and, and learning about yourself or whatever. You can kind of start to figure this out. And then, you know, as I've said many times on the show, you can use your diet and your workout in ways to improve your life. So yeah. like it, when I know I'm going to go like I often, sometimes I'll go down to LA and I'll do these big podcasts. Right. And I'll try to represent the team and I want to be sharp. I don't care about, you know, how much I could squat or deadlift or if I have five, extra three pounds of muscle, I want to be sharp on the show. So what do I do? I make sure I go into ketosis. 
because I just feel my sharpest doing that. And I'll utilize fasting and, and I'll eat no carbohydrates. Now, if I want to like hit a new PR on my lift, or I know we're going to do a crazy workout, or maybe I'm going to be filmed working out, which rarely ever happens, but let's say I am. Well, then I'll introduce some carbohydrates into my diet and you can do this. You can do this and mess around with it to maximize the quality of your life. You not only can do this, you should learn to do this. This instead of becoming a zealot about a like single one way, right? yeah, one way of eating because you've now attached, oh, keto is for me. Well, okay, for you for what reasons? Oh, you like the 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 mental sharpness. Oh, you like how there's lot less you're less bloated. Okay, well, those are all positive things. But what about when you decide you want to go after a squat PR, yeah. do you think mm -hmm. keto is going to be the best thing for you? I'll tell you, it's not going to be. No. Or what if all of a sudden you decide you want to sign up for a Spartan race with your friends? Do you think training for that on keto is going to be ideal for you? Probably not. Like, so learning about your body and how it responds to all the different ways of eating and then learning how to ebb and flow in that and, and for what reasons that you, you change the diet. I just think that everybody, I mean, this is later in my career, this is how I used to train all clients. Is that when oh, they would, you're teaching them lifestyle? So yeah, that's at, great. at one point when they would they would hire me, I would take them through like all the diets, everything. I would take them through mo all the popular, right? Whether it be a, a ketogenic or a you know intermittent fasting type of deal or a vegan diet, and, and I'd let and I'd explain to them as we are like I, I'm I'm inquiring, how do you feel? What do you notice? Like, okay, cool, you notice that this you feel this yeah. way in these times in your life. This is a great opportunity yeah. to shift shift eating like this. I'm not getting good sleep like right. i have a protocol for that i'm you know feeling some kind of indigestion constantly like i got a protocol for that i want more performance in the gym you know so you just start to figure out like what foods pair best to that or what calorie amounts or what timing with the whole thing and that's very important yeah and understand. it's all fun it's yeah. all super fun you know one one thing i did notice on keto which is really and you know the, obviously the mental acuity or whatever and it's probably a five ten percent improvement so it's not huge but it's enough to where I can tell. Here's the other uh, weird stuff. I notice my skin becomes resilient to sunburns. Very strange. So if yeah. I'm on keto and I go out in the sun, I don't sunburn as easily. I don't get sore as much in my workouts. Um, and uh, yeah, those are the two the two big things that I noticed. It was really, really strange on a diet like that. So if I'm going to go out and be on the sun a lot, um, then I tend to do you know keto diet. Look, if you like the show, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find us all on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was hardest. for me. It was for me, for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 